to you. So take it away, Terry and Dennis. Hello, everyone. I'm Terry Pellegrini. I'm a 2020 Master Gardener. I am really pleased to have all of you here with us tonight so we can talk about worms and vermicomposting. Um, this is something that I've been really enjoying lately and I'd like to share that with you. I'm Dennis and I'm a graduate in 2019. And glad we have, have you folks with us tonight. So we've got a poll for you. Have you, did you attend our 2019 vermicos, vermicomposting class? Excuse me, I can talk properly here. Have you ever composted using worms and were you successful? And Go ahead and write that, that in the chat got. box for us. Awesome. <laughs> Let's see, do we have anything in the chat? Um, there we go. No, looks like we haven't had anybody. Never worked with worms. Cool. Laura, you're going to have a lot of fun. Worms are great. All righty. And Joan's already done regular composting. Oh, so we have somebody who's been vermicomposting for 15 years. That's awesome. And Teresa's had hers for about three. That's great. Dennis, do you want to tell them about our agenda? Well, what is vermicomposting? Actually, vermicomposting is a product of decomposition process using worms to create a mixture of decomposing food waste, bedding materials, and vermicast. Verma is Latin for worms. So we're going to be composting with worms tonight. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, composting. This can be done indoors as well as outdoors. Now, worms eat food scraps and organic materials, which creates a vermicompost, which is a very valuable soil amendment. What types of worms do we want to use? Well, red wigglers is the most common name. Some people may have heard the, the names of manure worms, branding worms, panfish worms, trout worms, or tiger worms, but these are all the same. Red wigglers produce very quickly, which is a very useful type of worm to have. Red earthworms are slower to reproduce, so we don't use those as much. The worms are rarely found in soil. Now, if we go out in our backyard, in our garden, and dig up worms, these generally are not the types of worms we want to use. These are earthworms, which are used for fishing, not for vermicomposting. If you find any of the red wigglers out in the garden, it generally will be in rotting vegetation, compost, or in manure piles. Now, what do we know about worms? Well, worms have no eyes. That's why they go away from light. These worms need to breathe, need to be kept moist because they breathe through their skin. Now, worms have a mouth a gizzard to digest their food, five hearts that pump blood through this body, and they have segments with little tiny hairs that help them move along. Why do worms eat our garbage? Years and years ago, they were told this is a gourmet meal and we're not gonna tell them any different. <laughs> Red wigglers eat decomposing organic materials. They can eat as much as half of their weight every day. 
Vermicomposting takes advantage of this great talent. Worms reproduce very rapidly. Worms are hermaphrodites, which is a big fancy word that means that they are both male and female, but they do need to have a partner to reproduce. Worms can produce up to two to three cocoons per week during the breeding season. Each cocoon will have one to five baby worms generally, but they have been known to have as many as 20. So you can see, you can get a lot of worms in a short period of time, which means you only have to buy one batch of worms to get started. <laughs> now, babies will hatch in two to three weeks. When they hatch, they are fully formed. The new worms, as you can see on the picture on the right here, are clear whitish. And in six weeks, they can reproduce. Now this picture we have on the left is, uh, shows a couple of cocoons, which kind of look like fish eggs. The worms doing their magic produce what we call vermicompost which contains small amounts of many nutrients. These nutrients release slowly as, as the compost breaks down. This is wonderful for adding to our houseplant containers, seed starter mix, or to your garden. Yeah, Before we get into I... how and we feed our worms and harvesting our compost, do we have any questions? This is a great time to put your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A if you have any questions so far. Anne, do you see any questions? No, I don't think so. I think we're ready for a poll though. Awesome. So what kind of worms thrive in a worm bin? Is it worms from your garden, red wigglers, earthworms, or night crawlers? Go ahead and pop your answer onto the poll. And I do see a question from Pat. She asked, when is breeding season? Answer is all the time. The worms will continually reproduce. And here's our poll results. Looks like we're all very smart tonight. It is correct, red wigglers. All right, Terry.
Hey, right, great job, Terry. I love that video. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more here. Okay, so where can red worms live? Um, there's many places they can live. They can live indoors like we did with our bin. They can also live outdoors. Of course, if they are living outdoors, you're going to want to make sure they keep covered. Um, these pictures here don't show them being covered up, but they do need to be covered up with some cardboard or something like that to keep them from drying out. Um, if you are going to make a bin for them outside, you want to make sure you use untreated wood. Um, there are chemicals in treated woods that could harm our worms. Um, we also have this really nice uh, gray structure here in the middle. It's a very nice layered worm habitat. Uh, really nice. Uh, if you have the space for it, it's great. If not, again, just a small bin will work. Um, we have a nice brick one here. And then if you can't see the one with the person pointing into it, it looks like it's got a hinge lid on it that pops over to keep your worms uh, from the overexposure. Oops. So worm ambiance. Yes, your worms like to have a particular ambiance in order to do their thing and compost your garbage for you. So you're gonna need to choose a moist, dark environment Keep it around 50 to 80 degrees. That way they don't get too hot or too cold. Uh, being indoors is great as long as you avoid direct sunlight, both outside and indoors. If you've got heat uh, from a window on that bin 24, well, not 24 seven, but you know what I mean, uh, for quite a long period of the day, that's gonna help dry out your bin as well. So you wanna keep it protected from that direct sunlight. Um, Place in a nice area where you're not going to get too, too many changes in your temperatures, 
like in front of a door or anything like that to keep them in that 50 to 80 degree range. So worm homes and hotels. I like that, hotels. Um, so use a shallow container, usually around 18 inches deep. Uh, you wanna have some room for their, their bedding for them to move around. Um, don't use a clear or a light colored bin because you wanna keep that light out there. Again, as Dennis said earlier, they don't have eyes and they shy away from the light. So you wanna have a bin that's a little darker so they can keep that nice dark environment. You can do repurpose all sorts of different containers for it. Um, plastic kitty litter bins work well. Anything that has a lid or that you're able to place uh, something over the top to protect them. We want to drill eight to 12 holes in our bins on the tops, the sides and the bottom. And use a, a 3 16th to a quarter inch drill bit usually works well. Um, a plastic bin may need a little bit more drainage because of course it, it doesn't have any way to, to lose any of that moisture. Um, want to keep your content from getting too wet. If you do see it's just a little soggy in there, you might need to drill a few more holes. Place your bin on top of a couple bricks or some wooden blocks so the air is circulating around the bottom as well. Uh, a lid of another bin or something to catch the moisture underneath is great. And then also catch little pieces of the um, vermicompost that drops out as well. Bedding, you can use many different types of things for beddings. Um, in the video, I use shredded newspaper, but you can also use shredded leaves and cardboard, chopped up straw and dead plants, coconut core, which is that fuzzy stuff from the inside of the coconut, um, sawdust, of course, if you are going to use sawdust, you want to make sure that is from untreated wood, dried grass clippings, and you do want to make sure they're dry. And then we want, I want to add two handfuls of sand or soil into that uh, bedding to provide some grit for the digestion. Excuse me. <laughs> so once you have everything ready, you want to fill in the bin with some damp bedding. Now bedding should be like a wrung out sponge. So you wanna make it wet, but not so wet that it's dripping out of your hand. Um, bring it out, make sure there's not any excess moisture. And again, excuse me, hot. <laughs> sorry, allergy season. Um, so it should be like a wrung out sponge. Now you wanna lift up that bedding too. You wanna to make sure that there's air circulating through it. So you don't want any clumps, especially if you're using like newspaper or something like that. So just kind of fluff it up a little bit to get the worms some space to move around, get that air moving through. And that helps to control any odors from the decomposing, decomposing material. Next, we want to add our worms. You can see these wonderful red wigglers sitting here. Um, you can add up to one pound of worms in a bin, especially the big large one like I was showing earlier. If you're using a smaller bin, of course, you wanna make sure you're kind of gauging how many worms you think are gonna work in there. Um, now remember, they can eat a lot of food a day, uh, up to half to one pound of scraps per day if you have a thousand worms. So. If you don't have that much scraps, you might wanna make sure you have less worms in your bin. And do we have any questions? <clears throat> uh, I apologize. Oh, it looks like Gail had mentioned in the chat that she has worms that have survived through freezing winters for many years, but she always has a good bedding layer on top of them. So that's great, Gail. Sounds like you've done a lot of vermicomposting. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, uh, Laura, we are gonna be talking about what food scraps work. And then how much food does thousand worms eat? Again, they can eat a half pound, to up to a pound of food scraps a day. So that's that's a lot of leftovers. <laughs> All righty, take it away, Dennis. 
All right. Now we're going to talk about worm care, feeding, and why we're all here for harvesting. What is our gourmet food for our worms? By using kitchen scraps, we can save 40% of our kitchen waste. Worms like to eat vegetables, food scraps, eggshells, bread, grains, shredded newspaper, and cardboard. Coffee grounds, tea bags, tissues, paper towels, and dried leaves. What they don't like is onions and garlic. You don't want to have a bin full of worms with bad breath. <laughs> they love meat, dairy products, fats and oils. I'm sorry, they don't want meat, dairy products, fats and oils, pet waste, or too many citrus peels. Use those citrus peels for your garbage disposal to keep them smelling good. Now, how do we feed them? At first, we just need to feed them once a week. As our worms increase, we feed them more often. Now, worms eat the bacteria growing on the food waste along with very small pieces of wood, uh, food, small pieces of food. Cut your food into small chunks. Bury it three or four inches underneath the bedding. If you lay it on top of the bedding, guaranteed to attract fruit flies. Divide your bin into three or four imaginary sections and bury successive loads in different locations in the bin. What we're talking about is when you feed it in one section, the next time you feed it, put it into a different section. Worms are just like your teenager. They will go where the food is. <laughs> now, we need to handle our worms gently. Use a plastic garden fork or a wooden kitchen spoon to bury the food. A fork is less likely to injure worms. And the last thing we want is a lawsuit from injured worms. <laughs> Don't use a hand trowel. Trowels are for soil not for feeding worms. Remember, our worms don't eat quite as much as we do. So some foods need to break down before the worms can eat them. You never put your food in a blender. Your blenders are reserved for margaritas. <laughs> it releases water, so it makes your bin too wet. Now, can anybody tell us what do worms eat? Let's have a little quiz here and see if you've been paying attention. Let's see. Uh, nobody's okay. People are voting. Here we go. Do they love everything? Only fruits and vegetables, steak and potatoes or everything except for oils, fats, meat, and dairy. We'll give folks a couple more seconds here. Oh, and I missed the funny one, delicately with tweezers. Make sure classical music is playing in the background. That was Dennis's idea. <laughs> All right. Well, this looks great. Looks like everybody was paying attention. Yay! <laughs> so definitely everything except for oils, fats, and bury a small amount of food in one location per feeding. Okay, let's see if we've got any more questions. See, so somebody said here, in the photo, there was a white kitty litter container and a white bucket being used as worm composter. Is that okay as long as it's in a dark location? Um, actually, yes, um, as long as it is in a dark location and it's not, it's very thick and you can't really get any light through it. Is that correct, Dennis? Yes, that is. Worms so, do not like uh, light. That's why they run away from it. And what else do we have here? 
Um, Mary asked if there's any issues with sharp broken eggshells. I've never put eggshells in my worm bed. How about you, Dennis? What do you know, know about the eggshells? I, I think worms can handle the eggshells. I wouldn't be too, too worried about it. Yeah, I was going to pop in and say that um, in my experience, they love eggshells and they will lay their eggs in there. And then all the little wormies, you will be able to find them in their eggshells. So it's kind of a fun thing. Try it out. I will have to Great try that question. out. Yeah. And also, is mold a bad sign? Um, I get mold on mine and I've never had any issues. It's usually on the, the food stuffs. And remember, the worms are not just eating the foods, they're also eating any bacterias and things. So if that's mold is spawning any bacteria, I'm sure the worms are, are happy to eat it. And then one more. This is for you, Dennis. If I still see lots of food, should I feed them again? No. Let, let them finish that up first so it doesn't, again, so it doesn't go bad. And then Stuart asked, how often do I have to feed them? Is two times a week okay? It'll depend on how many worms you have. Remember, our worms will eat a half to a pound per 1,000 worms. I noticed that if, if I check mine every day or so and to see if what is in there, maybe they're the pieces are too big or sometimes it's they're just not don't like what I'm feeding them and give them a little something different it disappears right away so sometimes you have to kind of play with that too all right all right let's get into the maintenance maintenance is pretty simple um, check your bedding weekly now we've talked about it before. It should feel like it's a wrung out sponge. Now, if it's too dry, just add a little bit of water. If it's too wet, you can add some more bedding to it. Now, here's, our, here's what we're working for. Worm castings or compost. After about six weeks, your bedding becomes very dark and decreases in volume. This is now our harvest season. You can harvest the castings. A castings is another word for worm poop. If the bin becomes overly full of worm castings, worms will die. Now we'll talk some different methods of, uh, of your hotels. If you have a, one, uh, a bin, you can use a one side harvest method which is you visually divide your bin in half, put your food on one side. Remember the worms will go where the food is. Once they've eaten that food, you can harvest the castings from the other side. And then you just go back, keep going back and forth. Now we have a hotel um, or we call it the moving up method. You started by feeding your worms in the bottom first. When that is done, now you uh, feed and the tray up above them. Again, the worms are gonna crawl up to the uh, bin above it. And if you've met, never seen it, it's kind of amazing. Those little worms will go through those holes that you can see in the, in the grate in, a, in the pan there. The worms, they leave the bottom bin, move to the upper tray, and then you can harvest the castings or worm poop from the lower tray. Or you can use a pile method. I do not recommend that you do this in the house unless you have a good divorce attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Dump the contents onto a plastic sheet, divide it into, it says five or six piles. You can put it as many piles as you want or as few. Your worms will move to the bottom of the pile because here again, they don't like light. They move away from the light. And now you harvest our compost from the top. Okay. 
Any questions on this topic? Um, I do see a question from Elsa. It says, when I add ketchup scraps once a week, is it okay or good to top it off layer with some of last year's potting soil? Um, I would have to say no, since red wigglers don't live in soil. They live in decomposing food. What do you think, Dennis? Uh, what was that again? I was trying to read and listen at the same time, and I'm not so very good. When she adds kitchen scraps once a week, is it okay to top it off with some of last year's potting soil? Hmm. I don't know why you would do that. Yeah, I, I, I again, would, I think I right, because red wigglers don't live in the soil, they wouldn't want any soil in their environment. They want to be in that decomposing the scraps and, and things like that in the newspaper. So mm -hmm. it seems like it'd be a good idea to keep it dark in there, but they're not really happy with the soil. Thanks, that was a great question though. Um, Terry asks, how long does it take for them to move from one area to the next? They move fairly rapidly. Um, it's a short period of time. Um, you can actually, um, when we're, when you do these classes live, we can actually see worms moving from one bin to the, uh, moving up to the uh, upper bin. So it doesn't take very long, it's cool. Um, Nina asks, says, my worms tend to fall into the lowest pan that has the liquid. How do I prevent this? I would say I'm you're holding sure. it. Yeah, maybe that, that, that's probably right to what, the holes may be too big. I've never seen that happen before. So that, that would be what I would think. Um, so you maybe, you might want to check and see if the size of your holes may be just a little bit too big for your worms. Okay. So we're going to talk a little about, about resources. So these are the books that seem to have started it all. Books, Worms Eat My Garbage, How to Set Up and Maintain a Worm Composting System. I have not read this myself. Um, I've been meaning to get a copy of it, but from what I understand, this is one of the best books to start reading about worm composting. We're gonna have a talk from when the, from our, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> again, my apologies, allergy season, from our library later on. So maybe we can talk a bit about that with them as well. So we also have some helpful links here. Um, composting with worms uh, from UCCE San Joaquin Master Gardeners. There's a link there. We can put that in the chat box for you. And this includes instructions on worms, worm bin suppliers, instructions on building bins, and Adventures of Worms website. <coughs> and where do we get our bedding material? Where you can get it at home with your shredded newspaper, cardboard, chopped up plants. You do want to avoid the glossy magazine pages. They're made with a different ink and it's not great for the worms. You can find stuff at hardware stores and nurseries. Um, again, the coconut core, uh, sand, and also sawdust. Um, you could buy that again, so get the sawdust from untreated wood. And where can you find your worms? Red wilderness, of course, are the best choices for our bins. You can get them at your bait and fishing stores, but you're going to really pay for them. Sometimes the best places to go are the online worm farms. You can get them very reasonably there, and they come in, with a, uh, in a, a protected package with some instructions on how to take care of them. And local. Well, I don't have too many local ideas, but I know we have some master gardeners that may have some worms, whether they're willing to part with them or not. 
Yeah, if I could just weigh in, Terry. Um, yes. Since we're broadcasting all over the state and other other areas, um, I think everybody just has to kind of look locally. But you could be surprised what you could find. Um, maybe even in the yellow pages. I don't know if people look there anymore. <laughs> yeah, like I said, the online worm farms are, are a great way to get your worms. Mm -hmm. oh. Do we have any questions? Um, how do you keep raccoons out of ground composting piles? Um, make sure that the stuff is very well covered. The stuff that you're feeding your comp your worms is well covered with it down at least three or four inches. So you don't get that smell attracting the raccoons. Um, other than that, I'm not too familiar with raccoons in my compost pile. So, um, there might be some other online resources in your area that can help you with that as well. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Stuart asks, do you add more sand over time? Um, I would think you would need to on occasion because if you're moving out that compost, some of that grit and that sand's already been used by the worms and it's not gonna be available for them anymore once you harvest your compost. Um, so you probably need to add a little bit here and there. And did you have something else to add with that? Nope, that was great. Oh, perfect, okay. Um, Gail wrote compost bins, but I'm not sure if that what her question was. So she might want to write in a little more detail. Yeah, she asked. She asked before that, and yeah, about oh, okay. the raccoons in her compost bin. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. Have a couple other tips. Uh, Mildy said eggshells pulverized can also be used as grit. That's a good tip. That's a great one. Oh, here's a good question maybe for Dennis. How do you store the compost? Put it in, a, uh, keep it dry, uh, somewhat dry. Um, put it in a, uh, five gallon buckets. Um, depending on how much compost you have. Yeah, they probably won't have too much, so I think they should probably try to use it up right away. Put it um, on in, in your house plants, out in your garden. I, I like the using it for seed starters because it's oh, nice and soft and fluffy. Yeah. yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, lots of places to use it. All right, Terry, we've got some troubleshooting with you. Troubleshooting, yes. So what happens when good good vermicomposting composting bins go bad? Um, so do you have a smelly or humid bin? That means you've got too much moisture. You might wanna check to make sure your drainage holes are blocked. If they are, of course, you need to get in there and block them. Maybe you have too much food in there and too much wet food. Um, you know, you put some really soggy pieces of veggie or something in there that's just sitting in there and, and causing too much moisture. You may have Added too many acidic foods like citrus peels or overly wet melon rinds. To correct that, again, add more holes or unblock the holes. Use a little bit drier foods and add more paper in there. So add more bedding in there to help soak up some of that moisture and bring that back again to the uh, not as wet as a wrung out, not as wet as a wrung out sponge. And then you should be okay. Worms in a mud bath. We were talking about that. Several inches of water at the bottom. So first of all, you know things are just way too wet. You're gonna to need to save your worms, pull them out of there so they can breathe. Too much water is gonna drown them because they are breathing through their, their bodies, through their skin. You wanna remove all the waterlogged castings because they're, you can't put them back in with the worms, it's just too wet. Pour out the water. And basically, you're going to need to start over again. Redo your bedding, get everything set up again, and again, check to make sure that bedding isn't too wet. 
put in fairly dry foods and get your worms back in there. Ugh, fruit flies, those little pesky things. As soon as they get in your house, it's almost impossible for you to get rid of them. They're usually just mostly just a nuisance. They're not gonna bother you. They're gonna flit around. Uh, so you can swat or squish them. But the best way to make sure they don't happen at all is to avoid putting too much food or spoiled fruit in the bin, especially just sitting on the top of the bin. You wanna bury it. If you bury it under where the under there, the fruit flies don't have a chance to get to it. Um, if your bin is uncovered, completely uncovered, maybe outside, want to put a piece of uh, old carpet, cardboard, or some kind of lid on it. And then believe it or not, a spider or two, add it into your pile if you're brave enough, are there to help reduce the populations. If they get in there on their own, great. Um, I'm not a big spider phobe, so I can actually put a spider or two in there if I needed to, to help reduce that fruit fly pop population. Again, we have good bugs. When you're in your outdoor bins, you're gonna find some great bugs in there that you don't wanna get rid of because they're helping bring things down and keeping away the, the bad bugs in from your compost pile. So you've got springtails, a little bug that kind of jumps at you when they're disturbed. Um, sow bugs, the roly polies, they're great in there because they get in there and help decompose all that, that waste. Fungus gnats. Those, if you get, there's too many of those, you're too wet. So a little bit's okay, but too much means your pile is too wet. Millipedes and soldier fly larvae. Again, these are there to help break down that compost. So they're good bugs. Now they should be in your outdoor bin. If they're in your indoor bin, you gotta wonder how they got there. Okay, your worms are missing. Now this is mostly for your, for your outdoor bins. Um, they may have decided that it's too hot or too cold or too wet or even too dry. And so they decided to get out of there. Um, if it's again in the ground, they may have tried to find another exit and get out trying to find a better environment. You may have some predators that are digging or disturbing your bin and they're in there uh, making the, basically chasing your worms away. Now, if you're missing your worms on your indoor bin, um, if you've got children, you might want to wonder, or grandchildren, check with them, they may have them. Um, if it's not covered, you may have a cat or something in there disturbing it, but normally your bins, your worms are gonna stay in your indoor bins. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay. Terry, did you see the one uh, from Stuart? Is there a method or strategy to minimize removing eggs while harvesting? Mm. Kind of a tricky one. I do not know. Um, but you said here, could I wait for a certain amount of time after I stop feeding them on one side for the eggs to hatch? That, I, you know what? That's a tricky one. I'm not really sure how you could completely minimize removing any of those eggs. I mean, there's just. You know, I would try those eggshells just to see because the times that I've used them, it seems like the worms really like to lay their eggs there. And so then maybe you'll be able to see them better. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I, I, I'm really not sure how you could go about. There's, you're gonna have some loss. I mean, unfortunately, worms are very prolific. So they're going to make up for that as quickly as possible. But yeah, unfortunately, I'm not sure that you can minimize all the damage on that. All right. Well, people might have a couple more questions, um, but I just want to remind you that you'll be getting an email from us in a couple of weeks. Um, actually, it's in a couple of months to um, ask you how we did and to find out if we are, um, you know, if you're learning some different things and, and that helps us improve our program. And um, we have with us today 
uh, our favorite librarian, I shouldn't say that favorite because we love all our <laughs> librarians, but one of our favorite librarians, Diane Bartlett. So if there are more questions, hang on till the end. And for now, we are going to uh, have Diane tell us what is available from the library. Great, thank you, Anne. So um, as was stated, my name is Diane Bartlett. I'm a librarian with Stanislaw County Library. And so my purpose here today is just to tell you um, a little bit more, give you some tips for finding gardening books in the, in the library. So in Stanislaw County, um, we have physical books available. You can uh, call up or go online and place things on hold. Currently, we have curbside pickup. But we also have access to books electronically. And I know many libraries across the country, no matter where you are, have both physical and uh, ebooks available. So check out your local library. But we have uh, books both on Hoopla and Cloud Library. Uh, what you all that, oh, if you could go back one screen. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, in order to access these apps, all you do is go into whatever, wherever you uh, download your apps from, either your uh, Play Store or your App Store, and look for Hoopla, uh, in this case, and download it. You might have to put in your library card number and, and set up a couple little um, passwords and things, but it's very simple. And then you're able to to browse it and, uh, and and borrow books on Hoopla and read them on your computer or your tablet or your smartphone. But today's topic gave me a t chance to talk about how it's not always easy to find what you want, e even in our regular catalog. In this case, when I looked up vermicomposting, I found one book on uh, vermicomposting as a business, and I knew that's not what I wanted. So I played around a little bit. I tried terms like worm composting and worm farming and worm gardening, and each time I found a couple more titles. So in this case, what really worked for me was to type in worms and then... Um, sort it by gardening. So when I did this, you, here's an example of the, most of the books that I found on Hoopla. So on the next screen, I talk a little bit about a couple of uh, those books that I've chosen. And there is Worms in My gar Garbage. When Terry said this is one of the basic books, I thought, well, great. I actually am doing my job right. Hooray. <laughs> So this one is the 35th anniversary uh, uh, edition. Um, the original author, Mary Applehoff, had passed away by this time. But her friend, who became her friend from reading uh, her original book, uh, Joanne Ozuski, I'm sure I'm messing that up. Oshevsky. Oshevsky. OK. And she, um, she uh, rewrote the book and uh, parts of the book to reflect more up-to-date data, but she was very, very careful to uh, keep the same tone of the book because she loved the book so much. It was so helpful to her. And how do I know this? Well, I did not read the book also, Terry, but I did read the, the, the preface, which is what we do as librarians. We live for those prefaces. Um, so in this book, it, it uh, talks about uh, the right kind of environment, the right kind of worms. And that's the only reason I got the poll right, uh, because I, I read a little bit from the book. It talks about the care yay. worms. Yeah, yay. And worm biology. So thanks, Dennis. We learned a little bit about that from this book, too. Um, so it also discusses other creatures you might enc encounter in the compost and how to collect your compost. So just reinforcing things that you all learned tonight. And the other book that I chose is called The Complete Guide to Working with Worms by Wendy Vincent. She has lots of practical advice and fun facts and has some family friendly activities. So this book covers information for the beginner and even those um, who want to start their own business. And in the acknowledgments, she says that she worked on the book while she sat in the library. So I guess that's the other reason why I chose that title. 
And on the next screen, I talk a little bit about our library in particular. Our website is stanislauslibrary.com and I would advise you to, to go there first to find the most current information on when and where we're open and what kind of programs and services that we are offering at the time. And you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And finally, on our last uh, slide, you can uh, ask for assistance by calling your, your local branch, or you can go online and under um, the catalog, the, the, the second to the last thing there is the reading recommendations. And if you click on that, you'll get a Google form and you fill out what, what kinds of books that you're looking for and what you like and don't like, even if it's fiction or nonfiction. And a librarian will get back to you with reading recommendations just for you. So thank you for giving us some library time. Go out and have fun with those worms. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diane. I'm, I'm going to have to try Diane. to use that too. get some books. Yes, I think you might have a couple more questions, Terry, but we will... Um be posting this uh, webinar to our YouTube channel in another week. Okay, let me see here. Questions. Uh, would it help or hurt if I add some live bacteria by putting yogurt, sauerkraut, or kefir to the warm box? Um, again, that might be a little too wet to place in there. And it's not, again, dairy is not one of their favorite things, so we probably don't want to add in there. A little sauerkraut might not be bad, but again, it's very wet. And so you're gonna get that too moist of an environment in there. Maybe just a little bit. Again, keep the dairy away. Sauerkraut, maybe just a little bit, but I'm not sure if that's gonna help their digestive systems too much or not. Um, how long can worms survive without food? Not very long. You don't wanna keep them you know, more than a couple days. Uh, they're gonna eat the newspaper and things that are in there too. So as long as they still have some of that newspaper, they're gonna keep munching on that as well or whatever their bedding is. Um, other than that, you wanna make sure you, you check it and give them something to eat at first, maybe once a week, but once you get a larger amount of worms, probably every other day. I'm, I'm reading Katie's question here. She says, uh, mold can be harmful to worms, but when I feed the worms, the rotten food grow moldy very quickly. Um, two things, are you putting the, the food on top or are you putting it two to three inches under? And how big are the pieces, Katie? You wanna make sure the pieces are small, you don't want them too big. And then you want them underneath the bedding and not sitting on top, it will mold faster if you put them on top. Dennis, do you have anything else to add to that? No. Okay. That pretty much covers it. And Terry asks, is ta are table scraps too salty? It depends on what type of table scrap. If it's just veggies or something like that, you might be okay. But you don't want to put the dairy or the meat or anything like that in there that definitely would be flavored with something else. And Dennis, our, our, it says, is wor are worm castings alone too strong in nutrients for seeds and seedlings? No. Actually, I think they would love it. What do you think? Yeah, your, your seeds should really take off using just worm castings. Yeah, remember they, they contain a, a little of many nutrients, not a lot of too many if that makes sense. All right, any other questions? Okay. Do we have anything else for them, Anne? No, but thank you so much everybody for tuning in and thank you to Dennis and Terry, our very knowledgeable uh, speakers and master gardeners on worms and worm composting and what to do. So, and now is a great time to get out to your local nursery or hardware store, get the bin, get the supplies, 
talk somebody you know into drilling the holes or do it yourself. It's easy, you can do it. Um, ask around, see if your friends have worms or find out if you can find some worms locally or order them online. If you order them online, I mean, they can ship them to you really quickly and they stay cool. Just make sure you've already got your worm hotel all set up and ready to go before they arrive because you don't want your guests to come and you don't have a place for them to stay. <laughs> We will be teaching a class on spring vegetable gardening. So save the date of March 23rd, and uh, we will have more information on that coming soon. And um, most of you are signed up for our uh, newsletter, so you will get that information. Or if you're following us on social media, we will be announcing it. So thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Thank you, everyone. And thanks again, Diane. And don't forget to go on to your local library and get the Worms Eat Your Garbage book before somebody else does. <laughs> Good night. Good night.